Hello, everyone. Are you still fresh after two talks, ready for the third one? Um, OK, so ju just before I get started, I would like to, to thank the organizers, because they've been putting a tremendous amount of work into this conference. And from a speaker's perspective, it's great. Everything is perfectly organized. So congratulations. <laughs> I, I would also like to extend some special songs to Mark, because Mark came to me uh, last year at Dungan of the Hood and told me, Emmerich, hey, I'd like you to do a talk next year. And so I said, fine. And then he comes back six months later and he says, Emmerich, uh, I'd like you to talk about debugging. And I say, fine, there's certain people who've never done any debugging. That's totally not what they do six to 12 hour a day. And so I'll certainly be able to teach them something about debugging. So yeah, A plus idea, would buy again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I decided to, to, to reduce the scope just a tiny bit, and I will merely tell you everything there is to know about debugging performance, uh, which is a significantly smaller topic. Um, that will fit in an hour, but just wave your arms like this if, if I talk too fast, and I will make an effort to slow down. Uh, OK, and by the way, did you spot the bug? Right there, the bug. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's get started. I'm Emmerich. I've already been introduced. Um, I'm busy uh, creating the first collaborative peer-to-peer -peer insurance broker in France. This is a slightly complicated concept, but we want to make insurance much better than what it currently is. And uh, we can talk about this later if you want. So before we talk about performance, um, it's, it's important to think about performance from the user perspective. And for users, performance uh, is usually pretty much the same thing as, as speed. So um, is this thing slow? Uh, is it just regular speed? Is, is it too fast and did it overshoot the pond? Uh, well, with computers, we can measure uh, speed, or more precisely, response times accurately, but it isn't always obvious whether the, the figure means fast or, or slow. For instance, let's say 500 milliseconds. Who thinks 500 milliseconds is fast? Raise your hands. OK, nobody thinks it's fast, and you're all right, um, because fast is below 100 milliseconds. Uh, so there was some research by uh, Norman Nielsen, who are some of the, the gurus of uh, user experience, and they say that below uh, 0 0.1 second, it feels like uh, the system is reacting instantaneously, uh, and so you can just display the, the result and your user will feel like they're in control. Of course, often this isn't possible, and up to one second, all is not lost. Um, uh, responding within one second will not interrupt the user's flow of thoughts, so they will stay entirely focused on the task at hand. And likewise, you don't need to, to give uh, um, uh, special feedback on the, on the fact that the machine is working, uh, you just display the result. If you're slower and up to 10 seconds, um, the, the user will, will still um, stay somewhat focused on what they're doing, uh, but you have to provide some feedback that, that the system is working, especially if, you, if they can predict the response time because it's always three seconds and so they know they have to wait three seconds. There's nothing above 10 seconds because the user has gone checking their email or Twitter and you lost, you lost so. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so from the user's perspective and as web developers, the first contact with our product is when they're waiting for the website to load. So there's a blank page and it's loading. Uh, and you don't get a second chance to make a good first impression, so you have to optimize that, and caching is not going to save you for the first access. Um, usually, page loads are in the 2 to 10 seconds range, uh, unless you Google, but not everyone Google, uh, which means it's going to be in the slow category for most users, and that's why it's particularly uh, interesting to optimize. Uh, and I'm not even talking about mobile devices, uh, where you're in the more than slow category most of the time, uh, but well, <laughs> that's what we have at this time. Um, so. Uh, to optimize something, we have to measure it, and um, so we need to learn how to measure page load time. Uh, and we'll start, um, well, fortunately, uh, it's 2016, and we have performance of timing, which gives us all the data we need. This is available in IE9 and above, as well as all uh, modern browsers. Uh, unfortunately, it's very impractical for human consumption. <laughs> it's Unix timestamps. Uh, you may also have come across uh, this uh, panel in the debug toolbar, the time panel. Um, I don't know if it's really uh, used regularly by developers, but it shows pretty much the same data here. Um, this is extracted from a performance of timing. Um, but this is not going to help very much if you don't understand 
uh, what these lines uh, mean. And also, it's not going to help very much because this is running on your development laptop, which is not at all representative of production. So how do we get this data uh, in production? Um, you can use the Chrome developer tools, um, which have the option to throttle the network, uh, and so you can make somewhat more realistic measurements, but you still have your powerful machine that's running Chrome, and it's not quite the same thing as a cheap Android uh, handset from three years ago. Um, so a better option is to get the actual data from your users, and usually the best way to, to get it is uh, through a Google Analytics uh, site speed, um, if the website uses analytics, obviously. Uh, and then you can also slice and dice it by, uh, for example, device, by geography, etc., etc. So you can really understand what your user experience is like. Uh, it's sampled on just 1% of your users by default, which may be a, a, a bit uh, uh, small for a small and medium website, but you can increase this, so that's a trick, just Google it. Uh, you also have application performance monitoring solutions. These are usually commercial products. I'm not going to see them in detail, uh, but they give you that information. So what's, what's in performance of timing? Uh, it all starts at navigation start, and the current page is going to unload, and that's reported, but you don't really care about uh, the current page unloading, what matters in next page loading. Uh, the first step is redirects. If you have uh, HTTP redirects, they're going to take some time, and this is reported. The next step um, is the app cache. So this is for doing uh, progressive web apps and things with web workers. And, and if you want to, to talk about this, talk to Adrian, because he knows this much better than I do. Uh, so this will not matter for regular uh, HTTP applications that don't take advantage of these features. Um, then the next step is to make the DNS lookup. Uh, so the browser knows what server it's going to talk to, and this can take a surprising amount of time. It depends both on the quality of your user's DNS, which is usually provided by their ISP, and which can be pretty bad, uh, and it also depends on your own DNS, and if your DNS provider was chosen by your legal department because domain names are intellectual property, you might want to look into the performance. Um, now that you, you know um, the IP address of the target server, you're going to establish a TCP connection. Um, since you're running on HTTPS, you're going to need a, a TLS handshake to establish a, a, a SSL connection. Um, and this can take uh, between two and four um, round trip times, uh, depending on how many packets are exchanged. Uh, and so this is mostly sensitive to the latency between the browser and the server. Next, we are finally sending the HTTP request. We were requesting the page. Uh, there's a re request start, there's no request end for a fairly fundamental reason, which is you can tell when you have received some bytes from the network, but you can't quite tell when you have sent bytes to the network because there's tons of, of cages and buffers and there's this EOS, etc., etc. So it, it's very hard to determine when you've written things to the network. Uh, this comes up in all async uh, systems. However, you can tell when you get the first byte of the answer and the last byte of the answer. This depends both on how fast your server generated the answer. So now there we hit the backend. Uh, <laughs> we're in Django land. Uh, and it depends on how fast the network is between um, the, um, the server and the user. And then the browser is going to do a ton of stuff, and I will discuss this more in detail later, but the, all this is just to, to display uh, the page on screen. Um, so the lesson here is that these things depend a lot on the network and actually not very much on your backend. And no matter how much you optimize your backend, you're still op optimizing about 15% of the total page load time, uh, which is a good or bad news. Uh, as a backend developer, at least it's not your fault, but then you have to go fix some JavaScript, so <laughs> can't win every time. Uh, I made a few benchmarks uh, with a cold browser cache. Uh, DNS is cached, nothing else is cached. Uh, and for example, for my, uh, my content company's website, which is uh, the most trivial website you can imagine, um, the backend uh, takes 23% of the page load time, and I don't have a front end to speak of. 
Um, then if we look at a slightly bit of a website, facebook.com, uh, logged in, so I get a page that's very customized for me and that can take some time to generate. We are around 20% page, 20% uh, of the total time that is spent in the back end. Um, and then there's a ton of styles and images, etc. that get loaded. And the Facebook guys are supposed to know a few things about front end and it still takes 15 seconds to load for me uh, on my own connection, which isn't very good. <laughs> um, and if we look at an editorial website, so this website, I'm not logged in. It serves the same content to everyone, so it's faster in the back end, and the back end takes only 10% of the page load time. I didn't have an ad blocker for this, uh, to be honest. Um, so yeah, what happens here, what happens is that HTTP 1.1 is fairly bad at, at fetching tons of things, um, and we've created many workarounds over the year, both in the browsers. The browser use uh, DNS prefetching, TCP pre-connect to speed up future connections by making them speculatively. Um, they use connection keep alive and pipelining, that is um, sending a second request in the same connection before they get the response to the first request. Uh, they open six parallel connections uh, to the same server, uh, and of course they, ca they catch as much as they can. Uh, we, as developers, also do things uh, on the server side. Uh, we concatenate our assets, we minify them, um, we can uh, use a spriting for images, we can inline images in CSS or CSS in HTML. Um, some even uh, used to do domain sharding at the time. Uh, there were only uh, two parallel connections, so you had static 0, static 1, static 3, static 4, and then you had eight connections for your static assets. Uh, that's awful. <laughs> and of course, we, we try to help the browser catch our assets. Um, by the way, small digression, um, the only proper way to cache um, JS and CSS is to put the a hash of the file content in the file name and uh, set it with an infinitely long validity time. And when the content change, the hash changes, the file name changes, and the browser fetches a new version. This is the only way to do it. You can do it either with your front-end tool chain or with Django's manifest uh, static file storage. End of digression. So now that we've seen that it's not quite a problem with the backend, uh, let's talk about the frontend. Uh, you can do much about the network uh, between the user and your server anyway. Once you have a CDN, uh, your user is on a crappy 3G connection, that's it. You live with it. Um, and I'm going to give a few more details about that part which I skipped earlier. So, in the timestamp reporting by the browser, um, you have three steps um, which mark changes in the property which is reported under um, uh, document.ready state. And these three steps are DOM loading, DOM interactive, and DOM complete. I'm going to detail uh, them just later. And then you have two events that are fired during this process. It's DOM content loaded, and uh, performance.timing reports the start and end time for the processing of that, that event, and later, load. Uh, and likewise, the, the, the start time and end time uh, are reported. So it looks like this. Um, first, once the browser has finished downloading the whole HTML, uh, uh, response, so the, the response to the initial uh, request. Uh, it sets document.readyState to loading and it starts parsing the HTML. So th there's no event at this point because you don't have any JS yet because you don't even have any HTML yet. You haven't started parsing it. Um, while it parses the HTML, if it encounters some JavaScript, it will execute it. Uh, and when it gets to the slash HTML tag that terminates the document, or to the, the end of the document, basically, uh, it moves document.readyState to interactive and fires DOM content loaded. So this is the earliest point uh, uh, where you can uh, uh, consider that the, the, the page ha has loaded and you can run some code of use. You could also run it earlier while the DOM is loading, but this is perhaps not the best idea because you want DOM loading to complete as fast as possible. So once you're in the um, interactive state, uh, the browser may still be getting some CSS. Well, not really. We'll talk about this later. But it may still be getting some images, uh, which can take some uh, time to load, especially if it's a long page with many big images. Uh, and once it has finished that, it will move to the complete state. So complete means I have fetched uh, and loaded every resource that was referenced by the original HTML. Um, and it's, it means the page is fully loaded. 
But it's a bit of a lie uh, because with modern websites, most often we'll have some JavaScript doing stuff uh, after the, the, the initial page load. Uh, we'll have a Ajax request to populate part of the page. So this concept of load is a bit fuzzy, uh, and you shouldn't consider load to mean my, my page is ready. It depends a lot on your application. There's no general rule. Um, so the, the, um, the timeline I showed earlier can be interpreted like this. Uh, um, initially, you, have, you, you load the HTML. Here I have the fastest redirect ever. It's an HSTS uh, redirect, HTTP strict, trans uh, HTTP strict transport security. Um, this means that the, the browser knows that fractal ideas must only be accessed over HTTPS, and so redirects by itself to HTTPS. Uh, do this, you, you can uh, save up to 500 milliseconds on your page load time. Um, then, once here it gets the HTML, and when it has the HTML, we're at DOM loading, uh, and it starts fetching all the JS and CSS here. When it has uh, fetched and executed the JS, it uh, reaches DOM interactive and fires the DOM content loaded event. And when it has finished loading the rest, so in this case an image and a font, we're reaching DOM complete and the load event is fired. And it's a really good thing that I did this talk because then I could <laughs> check my own code and run my JavaScript on DOM content loaded instead of load, so it, it runs earlier. So um, this is a very, very common mistake. You don't need to wait until all images are loaded to run some JavaScript. Um, so that's the general idea, and now we're going to um, dive in a bit more and explain how browser uh, load pages, ha, ha, what works they, they do uh, in this period. Um, so basically you have some CSS, this is a very beautiful piece of CSS, uh, and then you have some slightly more confusing JS somewhere in your page, and you, you all know that you put the JS at the top and the CSS at the bottom, and then it's perfectly optimized. So you have about 50 tracking scripts hiding in the bushes there, but it's fine because of the bottom, so it doesn't slow down your site. <laughs> Everyone does this, right? Uh, well, it's a best practice, and I'd like to explore a bit uh, why it's a best practice. Um, so at a high level, um, all browsers have a rendering pipeline, and this is sufficiently high level to be accurate for Firefox and Chrome at least. Um, so th they get some HTML and CSS from the network. Uh, things we get from the network are shown in green on this uh, diagram. Then they pass uh, the HTML and build something that's called the DOM, which, I which is just a data structure representing the HTML that, uh, so the browser can manipulate it. It does the same thing with the CSS to build the CSS ARM, and then it merges them in something called the render tree. Uh, so the render tree is pretty much the same thing as the DOM, but it's annotated with the style information taken from the CSS. Then once the browser has this, um, it can uh, calculate the layout, that, that is what goes where on screen. As you can imagine, this is fairly expensive to calculate the position of every item, uh, and to do this, it, it uh, needs fonts, which depending on your browser, can be loaded either um, when they are referenced in the CSS, i.e. does this, or when they're actually needed uh, to render the page, uh, Firefox and Chrome do this. Uh, so it's a trade-off. Uh, do you want to fetch them earlier, but perhaps fetch fonts that aren't needed, or fetch them later, uh, but possibly delay the rendering? Uh, and once it has the layout calculated, it can paint uh, things on screen, and then you can, at long last, see the pixels that represent the web page. If you have some JavaScript, when it's executed by the JavaScript virtual machine, uh, it will modify the DOM or the CSS ARM, and the page will re-render, and the browser will update these structures and, and do a repaint. Um, so what matters really uh, in this process is what's called the critical pass. Uh, so that's um, the, the sequence of events that uh, is a bottleneck for showing your page. And uh, this is how um, uh, you can represent it visually. Basically, to, you need a DOM and a CSS ARM to build a render tree. To have a DOM, you need some HTML. To have a CSS ARM, you need some CSS. All this is fairly obvious. And then if you have some synchronous JavaScript into the DOM, so that is a script tag that contains some JavaScript, or script assets as rc equals something that loads the script, uh, that script will be downloaded, if it's remote, executed, when the CSS ARM is ready. And the reason for this uh, is that JavaScript may access the CSS ARM, uh, and so JavaScript execution blocks on CSS. 
so this can cause some surprising delays, and it's something you, you have to be aware of when you're, you're trying to understand why your page loads like this. Uh, and then once the JavaScript is finished executing, uh, the DOM can complete, and you're there. So for those who prefer the text version, uh, this is the same thing written differently. Uh, we need a DOM and a CSS ARM, which require HTML and CSS. Building the DOM blocks on synchronous JavaScript. Executing JavaScript blocks on the CSS ARM. Uh, but I didn't mention the reason why uh, executing the DOM blocks on SyncJS. It's really a backwards compatibility thing. Uh, the JS could call document.write, which would have to be reflected immediately into the DOM. Uh, and so the browser cannot continue building the DOM until it has, con it has confirmed that the JavaScript didn't do that, which nobody does these days. So it's a bit of a shame, but that's how it works. Um, so the, the good news uh, in all this is that browsers optimize heavily page load time. So even if you don't do everything perfectly, they will compensate a lot. Um, for instance, they, they parse HTML incrementally as they get it for, from the network. They don't wait until they have it completely. Um, if they are blocked because they have to download and execute a script, they will try to, to paint off screen everything they have up to this point, provided they, they have downloaded some CSS and so it doesn't look too, too crappy. Uh, if they're waiting for web fonts, they will do a first render with a default font after three seconds uh, or half a second on Chrome and Firefox. Um, well, three seconds on Chrome and Firefox, I think half a second on Internet Explorer, and never on Safari. So if you're on Safari or iOS, you have to click the reader mode button so you can just read the text. <laughs> uh, and perhaps the most interesting optimization is a preload scanner. Uh, that's um, an optimization where the browser is going to look for script tags and style tags in the HTML and start fetching them even before DOM construction reaches this point. So, that's getting into the black magic territory. Um, so yeah, to sum up, uh, this is the reason why the, the proper order of optimization is first HTML, then CSS to unblock the first paint, even if you're waiting for JavaScript, also unblock JavaScript execution, and then to avoid uh, synchronous JavaScript, or failing that, put it at the bottom uh, uh, to avoid blocking DOM construction because there's nothing left to block if the script is at the, is at the bottom. Uh, however, it will still uh, delay DOM content loaded, which is the point where you can start animating your page. So it, it's not um, ideal. Uh, so I waved my hands repeatedly about this thing, JavaScript thing, uh, and I told you not to put script in line, but What's the alternative? Well, there's a better way, uh, which is called async script. So I, I guess most of you are familiar with this wonderful piece of software, which is uh, the, the Google Analytics tracking code. Um, I deobfuscated it, which will make it a bit easier to discuss. Uh, and here we have a very interesting pattern. Um, they are creating a, a GA function, uh, which uh, creates an attribute on itself, which is a queue, which is instantiated as an empty array. Uh, and whenever GA is called, it will just take the arguments it, it was called with and push them into the queue. And then later, the analytics.js script will, will kick in and will uh, loop through this queue and uh, handle this function call. So th this is called the um, async function queuing pattern, and I think uh, it, it's going to be a pattern we're going to use more and more to optimize the, the, the front end. The second interesting thing here is that um, they're creating a script element and inserting it into the DOM. Uh, and the reason for doing that is, that is that this pattern is called a script injected script, and it doesn't block DOM construction. So executing this piece of JavaScript is going uh, to block DOM construction. However, downloading and executing this one, which is much larger, will not block. Uh, so that's smart. Uh, they have good engineers. Um, it, it will still block a little bit, and there's a better way, uh, which is the alternative uh, Java tracking snippet, uh, which is shown on the same page, but surprisingly below uh, uh, what is the better version. Uh, and it looks like this, and once again, it's slightly better if you dare obfuscate it. We have exactly the same async function queuing pattern, and here we have script async. This is magic. Uh, so what does script async do? Uh, two things. Um, first, it doesn't block DOM construction. The browser uh, will download the script, execute it when it's ready, 
uh, but will continue parsing the DOM in the meantime. The second thing it does it is it doesn't block on CSS ARM readiness. Uh, so the script will execute when it's fetched, regardless of what the browser is doing with CSS. And uh, this is a good thing because most JavaScript doesn't care, of, well, it's not going to read your CSS or write in the document. Uh, so these arbitrary restrictions uh, uh, can be uh, ignored with the async keyword. If you are targeting old browsers, so typically uh, IE 9 and earlier, Android 2.3 and earlier, you have to, to write script async defer add a defer, which does almost the same thing uh, and, uh, and should work. Um, so I'm be taking bets, and I may lose, but I'm taking bets that the, the future best practice for uh, performance in web pages is going to look more like this. Um, if you need to expose an API to other scripts, likely you will expose it with some async function queuing, like we just saw for Google Analytics. Then you will put your styles, um, uh, because, you, well, there's a most critical thing for showing something to the users that makes sense. Uh, so you want to start fetching them as soon as possible. Then if you have some JavaScript that's critical for rendering your page, because your page doesn't show anything uh, without JavaScript, put it there so you can start downloading it uh, immediately after CSS. And finally, this is optional, but if you want to um, uh, do some... Uh, uh, well, to pre-render a little bit of your page before you have even downloaded some CSS. You can inline some of your styles just enough to render your header and perhaps the beginning of the page. So this is some fairly advanced optimization. It's not very convenient uh, to set up, but well, it exists. And finally, keep putting at the bottom uh, everything else as a script async. And pray for HTTP2, because when we have HTTP2, we can stop minifying, we can stop concatenating, we can stop inlining, we can stop spriting, we can, well, we can stop all, all, this, all this crap. But th that, that's in five years. <laughs> okay, credits to uh, this guy who works at the Make the Web Fast team at Google and who knows a bunch about performance, and you can re read everything he wrote if he wants to know more. Uh, whew, that's it for front end. Let's talk about back end for now. <laughs> Let's talk about backend now. Uh, I, I think it was really important to talk about frontend uh, because first you're all more familiar with backend, and as you can see, it's not that scary. Uh, if, if you take things with method, uh, you can understand what goes on. Uh, so. Uh, I would like to describe, similarly to what I did for the browser side, I would like to describe what happens on the server side. Fortunately, uh, it's a bit simpler, especially since uh, we got the new model for middleware that's landing in 1.10. So now it looks like this, uh, leaving aside channels for a minute, <laughs> so we're in traditional mode for, for uh, serving requests. Uh, at the very beginning, the request started signal is fired, um, and the a request object is built from the WSGI environment. So this is the request object you will receive in your views. Um, then we enter the, the middleware. So now middleware uh, is um, a, a callable uh, the, that receives a get response uh, function, and it can call get response to, to, to call all the middleware after itself and the view. Uh, and so it doesn't know really what's after itself. So each middleware can run code before calling get response and after calling get response. So this is the part that's uh, before get response, and you can imagine that you can have multiple middleware in a row here. Then uh, you have really the, the core processing uh, of your view that will involve URL dispatching, executing your view, so that's where you, your code lives most of the time, and if your view renders a template response, separately from that view, um, the template response will be rendered. Uh, so that's, that's the point where the, the context is interpolated into the template. And so this can take some time. And so if you just benchmark the runtime of your view, you may be surprised because a lot of time may be spent there, actually. Um, furthermore, uh, in between these steps, if you're implementing a class-based middleware uh, and you have um, a process view, a process template response, or a process exception method, these methods may be called. Uh, I think they're going to fall out of fashion, uh, except in cases where they're really necessary, because the, the, the new middleware model supports them, but uh, it's easier to just put the code here or there after calling get response. And 
after going through the response middleware, so which are the same as a request middleware, but in reverse order after calling get response, uh, you end up returning a response object, which Django passes back uh, to uh, the, the WSGI server by calling the start response function and returning an iterable, basically. Uh, and this can still take a bunch of time because the WSGI server will iterate on the object you returned, uh, send that data to the client, and once that's done, it will call the closed method of the response class, uh, which will have the request finish signal, and it's at that point that your, uh, uh, the view has really finished executing. So the total runtime goes from request started to request finished. The easiest way to instrument is to hook to the signals, but you can also instrument as, at various points uh, uh, in the middle to understand what goes on. Specifically, you should be careful about middleware because these execute at every request, and if you have a middleware that does two SQL queries, it's going to, be to do two SQL queries for every single request to your website. Uh, so, so usually middleware are small individually, but since they're executed a lot, this can add up. I started talking about SQL queries uh, because as you all know, when something's slow in Django, usually uh, the best thing to do is to look at SQL queries. And it may not be the database that's slow, it may be the ORM that's slow, actually. We're going to, to see this. So I made a quick test setup uh, with a table generated by PGBench, which is a tool for benchmarking PostgreSQL. Uh, I created uh, about uh, 300,000 transactions uh, 330,000. Uh, and the, um, the structure it generates looks like this. So I have a, it's a schema for a bank, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I have a branch which has accounts, which has tellers who serve transactions, and, and the transaction tied to all the other objects. Uh, I deployed this uh, to Heroku, so you can go take a look at, the, at the, the thing live if you want. It's running on a Hobby Dino and a Hobby Basic Postgres uh, at Heroku, which is a, a representative setup of many small sites, I think. Uh, and I mean, the, perhaps these sites are those who can benefit most from the, the optimization I'm going to show. So I think it's a, it's a good test setup. Uh, I didn't the, the generate the, the data over there because it would have taken about five days, uh, so I just copied it from a machine to, to, to Heroku. Uh, so the, the first thing I'd like to talk about is um, selecting and prefetching related instances. So let's start with select related. Uh, I guess most of you have at least heard about it, uh, but, but let's recap quickly. Um, here I am in an admin views that shows my transactions, and for each transaction I'm showing the teller, the branch, and the account. And of course, that's made in 300 SQL queries, uh, because for each row it makes a query to get the teller, a query to get the branch, a query to get the account, and so I have uh, three times 100 uh, queries. So that's bad, and I can Add a, uh, override the get query set method in the admin class just to select related tellers, branches, and accounts. Or even better, I can use list select related, which is a shortcut to do the same thing. And suddenly, it's so much better. I have only four uh, database queries. And uh, the last one isn't even that expensive. It takes like four milliseconds. Uh, so the thing is suddenly 20 times faster than it, than it used to. Um, so what does select related do? Uh, basically, it just creates a join uh, to related tables. This uses exactly the same joins uh, as, uh, as Django would use if you were filtering on related objects. And it can follow foreign keys forward. It can follow one-to-one -one field forward because they're pretty much the same as foreign keys. And it can also follow one-to-one -one field backwards uh, because just Django knows how to make uh, these joins. You can call select related without any arguments. Uh, and in this case, it will follow all non-nullable foreign keys and one-to-one -one fields recursively. So it can go quite far. Uh, for this reason, it's not a very good idea because you could have accidental performance regressions if for any reason you had new foreign keys and suddenly Django starts prefetching them. So always specify explicitly uh, the, data, the data you want. Um, this behavior of, of fetching only uh, non-nullable foreign keys doesn't make a lot of sense to me, to be honest. Uh, it's implemented like this um, because when uh, the foreign key is not nullable, Django does an inner join in SQL, and when it's nullable, Django has to do a left outer join. And there are, or there were, circumstances where the left outer join is much slower. 
Uh, I'm not sure these circumstances uh, still exist these days, uh, and um, there's a serious drawback to the current behavior, is that the admin automatically adds the select related for foreign keys, um, but only if they're not nullable. Uh, so that's why I have the problem. The foreign keys in my example are nullable, so I had, I had to add the select related explicitly. So all this sounds a bit messy, uh, and I would love to take a look at the sprint to see if we can change the behavior, uh, because we consider the performance difference is no longer significant these days. Let's move on to its friend, prefetch related. Uh, so here's a variant of the same problem. Uh, here for each, so this is a view of accounts this time, and for each account I want to show the list of transactions. Uh, so, of course, this is naively making one query per line to fetch a transaction. I have 100 and something um, uh, queries, uh, which appear here, duplicated 100 times. And I can use, this time, prefetch related uh, by overriding the query set like this. I just uh, ask Django to prefetch related transactions for each account I'm selecting. And once again, it's so much better. This time I have five queries, and you notice that it moved from uh, 304 to five. So actually the prefetch rating is making two queries, which we are seeing here, the first one and the second one, which prefetches the related objects. So how does uh, those prefetch related work? It's very different. This one does uh, two query, the first one uh, without the related object, and the second one only to fetch the related objects. And then it does the join manually in Python, so it, it just, oops, it just adds, uh, it just attaches the, the related objects to the primary objects. Um, the, so the related objects are, are prefetched with, um, with a big uh, uh, select something, uh, where ID in, and then a big list of IDs, uh, which isn't a very efficient pattern for databases, and DBA is like complaining about this. Technically, it would be possible to reuse uh, the, the condition used for filtering the original query with some sort of joins and extract the related object like this. It's unclear that it would be faster uh, in general. Uh, there's a ticket about it, uh, which hasn't moved forward probably because it wouldn't be much better, uh, or perhaps worse <laughs> quite often. Um, so this, uh, this technique works for any kind of relationship. Uh, foreign key, one-to-one, -one, many to many, forwards and backwards, because the two sides always share an ID somehow, and you can always figure from this column the set of IDs you need to look up in that column in one of the fields. Um, it even works for gener generic foreign keys, uh, but if you use generic foreign keys, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what I will say. Um, so, uh, the something to be careful with when you're using prefetch related is that um, any query set you have prefetched, you cannot filter or order or anything because that would cause Django to make a new query to the database uh, to, to, to fetch this uh, modified query set, and that would entirely negate uh, the point of prefetching in the first place. Uh, however, uh, if you need to customize the query set that's being prefetched, you can do it with a prefetch object like this. So for instance, here I'm telling Django to prefetch the transaction set by using transaction order by minus m time. And so Django will select the subset of this needed to attach related uh, transactions to uh, my original query set. So the signature of prefetch object looks like this. You tell it the lookup you want to follow, uh, then the query set you want to use as a basis for prefetching, uh, and then you can specify the attribute where you want to attach the prefetch query set on the original model. And this is very useful because if you, say, if you filter the, the, the query set you prefetch, and you attach it to the same attribute as if it hadn't been filtered, it's very confusing because you have fewer objects than what you would expect. So attaching under a different name it should be a mandatory practice uh, uh, whenever you filter uh, the related query set. Ordering uh, doesn't really have this problem, so, so it's less, uh, less of an issue. 
Uh, finally, one last thing I discovered while making this presentation. Uh, if you want to do prefetching on a set of objects that doesn't come from a query set, you can do it with prefetch related objects. So you can pass it a list of model instances you have around for any reason, and it will do the same thing. So that's cool. So when, when should you use uh, select related or prefetch related? Um, first, if you want uh, to prefetch many objects, you don't have a choice. Uh, select related doesn't work in that case. However, if, if, if you're in the something to one uh, column, so uh, that is forwards for n key, forwards one to one, or backwards one to one, you can use either. Uh, and the documentation says generally you will want to use uh, select related. Uh, I, I think it's largely an aesthetic issue, <laughs> at least, um, because select related will do a join in the database instead of doing a join in the application. And as proper, applica as proper developers who understand the role of the database and the application, we feel bad about making join in the application. Uh, however, uh, the performance implications are, aren't obvious. Um, uh, the factors are the following. First, select related will fetch more data because if the same related object need to be attached to several original objects, it will be fetched as many times. So you end up fetching some instances repeatedly and instantiating them repeatedly. Um, however, prefetch related also has some drawbacks. First, it makes multiple database query. It makes one query per lookup and one query per level in the lookup. So if, if you're joining through multiple tables, it will do one query for each step in the join chain. Uh, and while it does this, uh, it could run into transactional consistency issues. Uh, I think this is largely theoretical uh, because I discovered the bug again while preparing this presentation and filed it, uh, just saying it's, it's possible this could happen. Uh, I'm, interesting, I'm interested if people have seen this in practice. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, which one is the fastest will mostly depend on the latency to your database and the latency will penalize um, prefetch related because it does multiple queries. So I did a quick benchmark so we can see how this pans out in practice. Uh, and for example, let's fetch all 300,000 transactions with the related accounts, and I have 100,000 accounts. Uh, this takes slightly above 10 seconds. Let's do this with prefetch related. It takes less time in the database, one second versus 1.32. However, it takes more time in total because reattaching all the objects in Python is slower. Now, if we're doing uh, the same thing with tellers, there's only 10 tellers, so uh, fetching them is basically free. Uh, and this time, prefetch related is a slightly faster um, because it, it only creates 10 tellers and then attaches them to all the transactions. However, it's only very marginally faster. Uh, if, you, if, if the teller model was larger, perhaps the difference would be more significant. So yes, this is very application de dependent. So now the, the $100 question is, if you're doing an API, all this stuff with the debug toolbar and everything is nice, uh, but, but it doesn't help because you don't have the debug toolbar around for your uh, AJAX query to your uh, API. Fortunately, uh, there's a solution. First solution is to um, reproduce uh, the same query with the HTML UI of the uh, Django REST framework. Uh, so you can take the, the URL used to fetch a JSON, just put it in the browser, and you'll get a nice HTML UI with the debug toolbar shown. Uh, and the, um, what I recommend is to enable logging of database queries like this. You just have to set the log level of the Django DB backend's uh, logger to debug. And then when you see something like this in the console, you know you're in trouble. Uh, and when you see something like that, you know that the trouble is fixed. Uh, if you want a slightly more beautiful display with colors and sparkles and everything, you can use Django Dev Server. Uh, it's a project that overrides uh, the runs for command and provides some nicer output. So that's it for select related and prefetch related, which are probably the most important and also slightly tricky optimizations. Um, I'd like to take five minutes to, to take about a few other OR optimizations and when it's uh, right to use them. Uh, so for this example, I'll still use the same data set. And this time, I'll try to compute uh, the total balance of transactions by tellers. This, this doesn't make any business sense with these models, but I think it's representative of something uh, many applications do, basically taking data and grouping them and grouping it and summing it. 
So um, a naive implementation is just going to iterate through all the transactions, uh, and for each uh, transaction, add the, the balance to, uh, to the, the appropriate teller. Uh, so here I'm using a default dict to make the implementation a bit more compact, so every teller starts with a, a balance of zero by default. Now, uh, this seems a bit wasteful because we're only using the teller ID and delta attributes, not the rest of the transaction object. And so we would like to fetch only these attributes, uh, which we can do with dot .only. Uh, dot .only as a friend, which is dot .defer, which does the opposite. Uh, you specify the field you don't want. Um, unfortunately, while this is about three times faster in the database because you fetch less data, data um, it's slower overall, uh, simply because the overhead of managing uh, only in Python doesn't make this optimization worth it in Python, uh, in this case. Um, so you can use only and defer when you, you need uh, model instances, perhaps because you want to call some method on them, uh, but you don't need all the data, the, the columns, and especially you don't need some columns that contain large data. If that's a use case you have in your application, most often the right answer is not to use only or defer, it's to move that data to a separate table that you can join when you need it. Uh, and so, for instance, when you, you write to, uh, to, the, um, to, to, the, to this model, you don't necessarily rewrite to the other table, you only write the, the small part that is often accessed and modified. Um, so since uh, that didn't work, uh, we can try the next tool in the toolbox, uh, which is values list and values. So here I'm going to, to, to ask for transaction topic that values list of teller ID delta, and this will uh, give me an iterable of tuples, tuples containing a, value, uh, a teller ID and a delta, and so I can just unpack the tuple like this while iterating on it and summing. And this is, this is way better. The database uh, is four times faster compared to the original version, uh, and the total time is almost divided by 10. And this is uh, a little known uh, fact, it's that instantiating Django model instances is super expensive. Uh, so here I, I'm trying to instantiate 300,000 transactions, and it takes about 20 microseconds per, per, per instance, uh, which adds up uh, when you have 100,000 of them. Uh, it's expensive notably uh, because when you, you call model.init, that triggers the pre-init the, the pre signal and the uh, post in its signal, which aren't widely used, to say the least. Uh, so there's almost never a receiver for the signals, but still calling them as a, as a little bit of overhead, and uh, that's part of why model latinity is slow. Um, so there are, are huge uh, gains to be made here when you just need the data. You don't need a model instance, uh, you're just going to, to manage the data with functions that aren't methods in the model. Uh, and you have a large amount of data, of data, and it hurts to say large when we're talking 10,000 uh, rows, uh, but that's Python, it's not that fast. Uh, at least C Python isn't that fast. Uh, and so a common use case for this is if you want to build a, a report where you're going to extract a ton of, da of data to, to give it to someone else, uh, you can have a huge improvement with, uh, with values, list of values. Finally, uh, this one is, my, is almost my favorite. Uh, Django has some uh, annotation and aggregation functions. And these are a bit difficult to use, but they're very powerful. So uh, for instance, here I can simply ask for the list of tellers annotated with the sum of transactions for these tellers. Uh, and uh, it's um, uh, about six times faster than the original version in the database, or seven times faster. Uh, and it's like a hundred times faster uh, overall, uh, because uh, once I get the result in Python, I just have to make a, a dict that contains 10 values, and that's it. Uh, so it may not be obvious to everyone that this is the right thing, at least it's not obvious to me at all. Uh, so I always print query set.query to check the general SQL uh, and to, to see if it makes sense. And I'm pretty sure that this does the right thing now that I've seen the SQL. Uh, that's the only way I managed to write annotation and aggregation queries, and I've written a lot of them. Uh, so uh, annotate and aggregate are, are fantastic when you can express the entire calculation in the database, or at least a large part of the calculation, uh, and when you, you need to manipulate, uh, once again, large amount of data, uh, if you're just finishing 100 objects, it doesn't matter because it's going to be fast anyway. Um, 
A very common use case for this is dashboards or KPIs, uh, what SIGs management we want to look at. Uh, there's a learning curve, but I think it's well worth it. And a last one, um, which is very rarely used, uh, it's iterator. Uh, it, it has an entirely different purpose. Uh, this one is not about optimizing uh, CPU usage or database queries. It's about optimizing RAM uh, consumption. Uh, so what iterator does is it allows you to iterate on a query set, but the results are not cached. So if you iterate on the query set again, the results will be fetched again from the database and, uh, and iterated on. Uh, so this avoids keeping the entire uh, query set of model instances in RAM, and that's why it's more efficient. Um, so uh, there are two uh, huge caveats to this. Uh, if you um, keep references to the instances, they will not be garbage collected, and so you will still fill up your RAM with all the money instances. And also, they are all fetched at once from the database. So what you're saving is uh, the extra cost of uh, taking the data fetched from the database and turning it into uh, a Django model instance. So let's see uh, what, what this gives in practice. Uh, we'll use the trace malloc module, which uh, is new in Python 3.4, and which for me is the first memory uh, uh, measurement uh, system I managed to, to, to understand in Python. I used those ones before, but they were complicated. Uh, and we can just do trace malloc the start, run uh, what we want to measure, and then ask how much uh, memory was used. And in this case, it used 160 megabytes, which is about 500 bytes per instance, which isn't totally bonkers, uh, uh, an excellence. Now, if we slap an iterator on this, we are down to about 200 kilobytes, which is uh, three orders of magnitude smaller, uh, because the, the garbage collector kicked in regularly and collected instances while uh, we were iterating. Um, so it, it's really easy to benchmark or use with this, and I think it can be, it can be useful. So that would be all for today. And if you have questions, let's go. Thank you very much. Um, predictably, we have a bunch of questions. Oh. Yeah, close enough. Um, so the talk was slightly in two parts. So we're going to, I'll start off with some questions from the sort of front end JavaScript -y part. Um, so question, can you do asynchronous CSS to sort of do a small initial piece of CSS for the basic styling and load the rest of it after the first paint? So yes, um, you can do this. You, you cannot entirely control at what point uh, uh, the browser will trigger a paint. Uh, because it will depend on what's cached, etc., etc. So the, the, the approach that's usually taken for this is to inline the CSS you really want first and put the rest of the CSS later down the page, which makes it a little bit de facto async. Uh, so th this is really the, the in, inline some of the CSS in the, in the head tag is the right approach to this, in my opinion. Um, with the content hashing name solution, um, is content hash as an e-tag a good enough solution for many people? That's a very good question. Uh, I have spent a lot of time trying to make e-tags work, and I could never convince myself that I did the right thing in, in all browsers uh, with taking into account gzip uh, and reverse proxies and Cloudflare and you name it. Uh, so uh, I think e-tags were a good idea originally, but the didn't turn out to be very practical, uh, and I would recommend against uh, using it because it's more complicated than, than what works best. <laughs> so moving on to more ORM-related queries, which we've got a lot more of. Um, can you imagine a sort of future stricter version of the ORM that would error out if queries weren't prefetched directly? Um, so it, it, the example is it's very easy for you know, like a, for, for select related style foreign key query for a, a template author or a front end engineer to add something there and suddenly you've got one of these k times n plus one problems um, that you didn't know you had. 
Yeah, so th th this doesn't sound entirely trivial because it means you have to differentiate be between a query set um, the, the developer created on purpose and a query set the developer didn't create on purpose. Uh, and code has a hard time reading the mind of the developer. Uh, so I, I can imagine ways where you, you would declare explicitly uh, on the query set the list of relations. You, you would allow the, dev the developer to follow on this and it will error out uh, if, for example, a template uh, tried to access a relation that, that isn't allowed. Um, well, I, I, I think it would be doable. I think it would be quite annoying as well. <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> um, does iterate, so the iterator method, does that cache and reuse model instances or does it throw them away and then garbage collect them? Um, so, so what um, iterate does is just it will yield instances uh, into uh, uh, the code that calls iterator. Uh, and the expectation is that this code will do something with them uh, and then just lose uh, references to them so they get garbage collected. Uh, and at least Django is very careful not to keep references to them, uh, so it's entirely a problem of user code. And the, when iterator is working, it just works within Django, or does it use the database itself to do the iteration? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, no, as I said, the, the entire um, query set will be fetched from the database at once. There's no support for things such as uh, server-side cursors. Uh, it would yet. probably be possible to implement that. I think we'd accept a patch for that, uh, but it hasn't been done yet. Um, you mentioned about printing out the query because you don't trust your annotation and aggregation queries. Um, these are less mental than they used to be, I hope. Now we have expressions in the ORM. Can you think of any further things that we could do to make it easier to understand and to ascertain whether the right thing is happening? Well, the, the, the thing is you, you will usually write a combination of values and um, annotate. Uh, if memory serves, aggregate can only return a single result from a query, which uh, isn't the most useful thing. Uh, and if we just go back to the slide, uh, with, uh, so, so for, for instance, I, I find that the values list dot annotate something isn't entirely obvious. My first instinct would be to fetch the teller ID and the delta and then do something with them. Uh, so, so as far as I'm concerned, it's, it, I always manage to write what I want to write, but it takes a, a lot of trial and error to figure the right order of invocation. So perhaps we can improve documentation about that by describing a process for writing these queries. Uh, but, well, it I'm gets, not able to describe it right now. It gets even more confusing when you're then doing a values list for performance afterwards. So you're doing a values list in two different places in the query mm. to, to do different things. Yeah, and then you can, you, you can change this for as long as what you want. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I, I know I've written uh, queries like this that span like 12 tables and that they took a whole page of code and they did the right thing and it worked and I needed these because they reused query sets that I defined somewhere else. So you can take this extremely far and it works surprisingly well. Uh, it's just, a, 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 well, as I said, there's a learning curve. <laughs> um, could you imagine a hypothetical GraphQL API that would sort of implicitly insert prefetch relateds or select relateds or onlys or defers or whatever as necessary based on the query that we are actually passing into it? Well, the, um, this is the more general question of how you implement a GraphQL uh, uh, API on top of an SQL database. Um, I'm not sufficiently familiar with GraphQL be besides the general concepts to see exactly uh, uh, how you do it in Django, but I suppose Django isn't that bad of a starting point to do it uh, since you have all the pieces in the toolbox. It's just a matter of passing GraphQL and putting them together uh, so it fits. So in... in um, just, <laughs> if in someone has a, has a few years <laughs> to write this. I've actually written some of that myself. Mm. Um, it's not open source yet, but I'd like to make it so. Um, in JavaScript land, or in GraphQL JS land, one of the approaches that they've come up with to solve this problem is a thing called data loader, where it sort of does like a promise-based prefetch related. So you just kind of access data, and it returns promises all the time, and then at some point it returns it. My feeling is that doing that in Django would be extremely difficult and require much better asynchronous support in an ORM. Well, one way to look at it is to say that this is a lot like the, the lazy fetching of query set results. 
so in that sense, uh, it, it's taken us a, a decade uh, to, to uh, have all these optimizations uh, implemented in Django, and we are rather ahead of the curve when it, when it comes to this sort of thing versus uh, what, what the, the more immature uh, JavaScript thing is. So now I, I think a good, the GraphQL is going to catch up and will have a good way to do GraphQL on top of, of an SQL database. Uh, I don't think it's completely uh, stabilized yet. Um, do you have any more memory debugging trips, tips like that, Trace Malloc? Trace Malloc, I think was the right thing. Well, um, uh, yes, Trace Malloc. Like that that well, we can I, use? I, I wanted to make uh, an example with Hippy and Guppy, uh, which are things I used before, but I realized that uh, uh, one of them hadn't been ported to Python 3, so I couldn't show an example. <laughs> uh, and generally, they were extremely painful. Uh, the, the only the situation where I really needed them was to debug a, a memory leak in a C extension. Uh, which is not the sort of thing you do every day, uh, at least as a Django developer. Uh, you can probably debug it with trace malloc, and it's probably less painful. Uh, trace malloc can show all the objects that have been allocated and um, uh, display st statistics, so you can show what, see what's most allocated, etc. So it's, it's much more powerful than what I, what I showed. It was just a teaser. Dead on time. Thank you very much, Amory. Thank you.